Hi, this is Gary Meese with the case against. I'm back again after a break of a couple of weeks. Uh, my laptop was in the shop that has all the podcasting software on it, so uh, I just simply didn't have the tools available to me to do a podcast. And so I'm I'm back I'm back to as normal as this gets, considering that <laughs> we're still in a shutdown here. But uh, we're going to be on episode sixty six today. Uh, Uh, and we're going to continue talking about uh, Jason Baldwin's lack of alibi. We'll see how far we get. Uh, I, there's quite a bit to go. He, essentially, he doesn't have an alibi, but he claims he does. I've already looked at the alibi furnished by his uh, that his brother attempted to furnish, and, and some other alibi attempts. And about these all these alibis, uh, Baldwin's attorney, Paul Ford, uh, later testified in a Rule 37 hearing, which is a hearing about the competency of his, the, the defense for Baldwin. Uh, Ford testified, I can only say that I concluded from my efforts that I did not find successfully what I was looking for for the purposes of establishing an alibi that I felt would not unravel on me, which is more detrimental than not presenting one at all, which I believe is more detrimental than than not presenting one at all. So Ford, Paul Ford was is essentially is saying that Baldwin didn't have an alibi that wouldn't make him look worse once... It, came you know once it, that we made it if they attempted to establish an alibi at trial with the witnesses he had the result would have made things worse not better he would have looked less credible not more credible as it is he offered no essentially no defense uh, he was hoping to get by with the fact that there wasn't really that much evidence presented against Baldwin it was enough to convict but it wasn't enough uh, it, it, standing alone, there really wasn't a lot of it, and uh, it was. But as I say, it was enough to convict, and uh, they were hoping that the jury would look at it that way. The jury did not, uh, and some people conclude that uh, Baldwin was unjustly convicted on that basis. Well, there was enough to convict. So there wasn't anything unjust about it, and it passed the appeals process. So there wasn't anything unjust about it. But let's concede that the case against Baldwin was not great at trial. Now, this is the case of the West Memphis Three. This is episode sixty-six. Written three. I have three books published on the case. There, I have a combined edition called The Case Against the West Memphis Three Killers. It's it's a revi- it's a revised, condensed, uh, re-edited version of two earlier books. It's essentially a two-volume set in roughly chronological order uh, called Blood on Black and it's the first volume, and Where the Monsters Go is the second volume. I'm reading from Where the Monsters Go uh, today, and this case involves the murders of Christopher Byers, Michael Moore, and Stevie Branch on May 5, 1993 in West Memphis, Arkansas. Uh, Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miskelly Jr., who were all teenagers at the time and lived in the area, were convicted of of uh, those murders in 1994. Now, they were arrested on June 3rd, 1993, after Jesse Miskelly Jr. confessed to police about his role in the killings, and more to the point, 
uh, Baldwin and Eccles' role in the killings. He certainly downplayed his own involvement, but he did describe Eccles and Baldwin being involved in th these murders and also being involved in satanic rituals. The next day, on June 4th, 1993, uh, Jason Baldwin's parents came in to talk to uh, Detective Brian Ridge. His, mo his mother is Angela Gail Grinnell, and his father is, stepfather is uh, Carrie Grinnell. Now, as she did in the first Paradise Lost movie, uh, Gail pushed hard on the idea that her son could not have committed the crimes because he was in school when Miskelly said the crime the crimes had been committed in the morning. Uh, Miskelly described being uh, at the woods at in the morning early in the morning, about eight or nine, and then also around noon. Uh, in fact, uh, all the, uh, the three little boys were all in school at that time, and Jason Baldwin was in school at that time. Uh, Miskelly, this is often cited as the, uh, a fatal error for the Miskelly confession that he gave the wrong times. Uh, and it would be if he were telling the if he were just being straightforward and just simply didn't know when he was there, then it would indicate well he's just making stuff up. A lot of the rest of what he he uh, t talks about in the confession is on the money. The in in is, is in accord with the facts and with the with the physical evidence, including the ev ev physical evidence of blood at the scene. Even though blood was not visible at the time, it did show up in luminol. And what he describes uh, in, in the killings is, is mirrored in the blood patterns that were that were discovered in the luminol testings. Um, But Gail's going to push real hard on on the idea that he couldn't he could, Jason couldn't possibly have been involved in this. Uh, the Grinnells told uh, Ridge, who's a West Memphis Police Department detective, that Jason cut the grass at his great uncle Hubert Bartouche's home on Park Drive that afternoon. And Park Drive is in West Memphis. It's roughly mile and a half, perhaps, to the crime scene. Uh, Ridge asked, okay, what time was it he was there mowing the yard? Terry Grinnell answered, about 4.30, about 4.30 after he got out of school, from 4.30 to 6.30 or 6 or 6.30. Gail chimed in, and my uncle paid him, and he said I'm going to Walmart and played video games with his money. Ridge asked, you know who was with him? Now, the Grinnells talked over each other during portions of the interview, duly noted in the transcription. The transcriptionist picked up Gail saying, Ken, Ken was with him, and uh, I think Damien was there. His mom came and picked him up. Terry added, picked him up where Jason lives. And his mom came come by and picked him up, and then he went with little Ken down to play video games at Walmart. Little Ken would be Ken, little bit Ken Watkins, Ken little bit Watkins. Uh, Damien is obviously Damien Eccles, and here what they're saying does meet with. <coughs> with uh, what's known of what's been described as Damien's alibi. <coughs> Gail said, Jesse, like uh, the times Jesse Miskelly said it happened that morning and everything, Jason was in school. And then Jason mowed his uncle's yard. He got some money, went to play video games. 
Ridge says, okay, uh, what time did he get home that night? Gail says, I think he got home about 7.30. Ridge says, 7.30, were you there? Gail, no, sir, I have to. Unfortunately, I work at night. I wish I didn't have to, but I've had to support my children. And then Terry chimes in. She had talked. She had called to talk with him on the phone. Gail says, yeah. Terry, at 8, 8.30, she knew he was there because Terry asked, Bridge asked Terry, were you home that night? Terry says, no, I was over at my mother's. My mother had an ear operation. I was over at my mother's house. Ridge, what time? Gail interjected, there was a friend of ours whose name... Ridge asked Terry, what time did you come in, actually? Terry says, me? Ridge says, yeah. Terry says, I was over at my mother. I didn't... And finally, Ridge got them to clarify that Terry did not come home that night, that he was staying at his mother's house, and that a friend, the friend of ours, <coughs> actually, which is who was actually <coughs> Gail's one-time boyfriend, Dennis Dent, was at the at the trailer at the time. Terry explained, he needed a place to stay. We was just helping him out till he found a place. Ridge spent much of the interview trying to calm the excitable Gail. She told him, one of the reasons why I told Jason not to talk to police is because I was told the police was going around and telling lies about Jason before they came to arrest him. As for Damien, after the police questioned Damien, there was rumors started, collected. Kids were saying the police had told him this, told him that, and I didn't. I thought in my mind then that the police were trying to make him out to be the guilty one. And Ridge repeatedly pointed out that Jason could clear up any question of involvement by proving he wasn't at the scene. And he told him, until Jason tells us where he was and we can check out that's where he was, we don't have a place to start. And if he can prove that that's where he was, I'm more than willing to see him be a free man. I mean, that that's the truth, but I can't even start until Jason tells me something. And of course, some of this is a police ploy to get Jason talking to police. Jason, on his mother's instructions, was not talking to police. Police had come over um, a few days after, I think it was on the 8th, 8th or 9th, I think it was the 9th, had come over to uh, Jason's house and talked to Damien and Jason. And uh, his mother pulled up, saw the police were there. She basically freaked out and told him not to say anything. It's the 8th or ninth. It was four or five days after the, the killings, the Sunday after the killings, which were on a Wednesday. Um, and, of course, this raised some suspicions with the police because they're thinking, well, why is she so concerned about this? Because up at that point, they really didn't have any evidence that Jason and Damien were involved, but they were among the many, many people they were talking to who were known to uh, be potential suspects based on past actions, Damien in particular, not so much Jason. Uh, Damien already had a history of violence and uh, had described to... Uh, Jerry Driver, the juvenile probation officer, uh, that uh, there was there were plans by a cult to do a ritual sacrifice of a human, uh, and he'd said, told Driver this months before. So that was among the possibilities that they were exploring. Though police really didn't take drivers 
they did check they did check Damien out and Jason out, but they didn't take his theories that seriously until until uh, you know Jesse confessed. Uh, and until uh, they had a sighting of Damien walking away from the scene in muddy clothes, and and when Damien gave an interview to police on the tenth, and basically made himself look very guilty, he also looked very guilty based on the FBI checklist on the questionnaire. Very, very, very uh, convicting answers. Let's put it that way. And Jason never did serve up a potential alibi to police. His mother and stepfather and his mother's soon-to-be ex-live-in boyfriend couldn't account for his whereabouts that evening or that afternoon, except for a, a late late phone call, which was between Gail and her, her son and, and Deacon Dan around 9 or 9.30. Uh, Gail gave a statement in 2008 that I learned that he had been playing a video game at local Walmart store or some other locations near Walmart and that he might have been seen by a friend of his there. Now, even at that late date, with millions of dollars at their disposal and some very high-priced legal advice and plenty of time to think about all this, that's the best Jason's mother could do. She couldn't come up with a precise location for her boy that evening. And she can't seem to name the friend who might have seen him. And this is all might. And I learned that he, and uh, she didn't have any, she certainly didn't have any direct knowledge of this. And she wasn't able, even able to come up with uh, names and circumstances and so forth to build up a credible alibi based on the information she presented in this statement. Uh, now, Paul Ford was surely reluctant to call Gail to the stand in Jason's uh, trial in 1994 because of her fragile mental condition. She'd been... Uh, she'd had a nervous breakdown earlier in the year, apparently tried to commit suicide, had been to the emergency room a number of times in some sort of mental crisis. Uh, and we really had, in addition, so that, all that presents a problem. But, you know, what, what she could have, what could she have actually testified to she could have said she believed her son was at home at the time, but she didn't have any direct knowledge of that. She said he was a good boy. There's some evidence to suggest, lots of evidence to suggest he wasn't so good. And, that, you know, he, he, that she said, oh, he's kind to animals and he loved art, which gets into a, well, maybe that's all true. So what? But that was her basic argument to police. Um, and as Gail stated for a Rule 37 hearing on August 13th, 2009, this whole event placed a lot of stress on me. It caused me emotional problems. I ended up losing my job and I had a lot of distress and anxiety. I needed medication and I had to go to the hospital. As I say, she'd made a series of suicide attempts before the murders. <coughs> she uh, she says she ended up losing her job. Uh, reports are that she pretty much stopped going into work whenever the murders occurred. Uh, And then when her son was arrested, she has a story, which I don't have in the book because I wasn't aware of it. I think maybe it's even been presented more recently, but certainly well, I certainly wasn't aware of this, this at the time she'd said it earlier, that she had uh, 
her boss was not going to give her time off to attend the trials. So uh, basically wasn't going to be supportive through, through this uh, ordeal. So she was essentially let go because of that. And then she also has had the excuse that she uh, was let go because her son was, you know, a suspect of this horrible murder. Gail, um, Gail was not going to be a good witness for her son. Uh, Paul Ford knew this. He testified in 2008. I know that she wanted desperately to be able to provide assistance in the form of he was here or he was there. I just never felt like I had reliable information from her. And just on the basis of the little bit we see here, it's understandable why Paul Ford believed that. Uh, up to this point, based on what we had last week, what we had this week, uh, Jason has one person offering up a, a, a real alibi if it, if it panned out, which would have been his little brother, Matt. And it's, a, it's a, an otherwise uncorroborated alibi furnished by his little brother. It's easy to see why the defense was reluctant to put Matt on the stand. And it's even easier to see that when other relevant statements are examined. Take, for example, the lovelorn tale of sad sack jail inmate Dennis Lee Dink Dent. Uh, Brian Ridge and assistant prosecutor John Fogelman traveled to Phoenix, Arizona for a jail interrogation of Gail's erstwhile boyfriend on January 7th, 1994, and a lead up to the trial. Dent, who was in his mid-40s and had been picked up on a fugitive warrant, recalled May of 1993 in surprising but credible detail. I remember uh, it being Mother's Day on that particular day. I know that Jason and his brother Matt had gone to school, had gotten home about two th around 2.30, which is approximately the time I called the man in the newspaper about buying some lamps. Uh, this man came over to the house at approximately 3.30, maybe 4 o'clock, to look at the lamps. He looked at it, bought the lamps. He gave me $10. Jason, uh, by that time, had mentioned he that he was going to go and cut his uncle's grass, Uncle Hubert. And then, which was uh, already agreed upon because he was supposed to have cut it the day before, and it, it had rained or something. His uncle Hubert had called and told him to come and cut the grass. So about 4.30, I took off to Walmart store to purchase some flowers for a Mother's Day gift. <coughs> While there, I observed uh, Matthew on the video game. As for any kids from the neighborhood being with him, I can't recall any of the people there. Uh, then I came back home and ate dinner and washed clothes. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, around 8, well, uh, a well, wait a minute. I missed a part about Kenny coming over. Kenny come over in the afternoon. He was looking for Jason. Yeah, he was looking for Jason to get a tape. I mean, a Nintendo tape from him that belonged to Jason. And Jason wasn't there. And uh, as far as I know, he wasn't there. I was outside talking with this man and the kids were running in and out. You know, Jason's friends coming and Matthew's friends and they were all just coming and hanging together. They were in there playing the Nintendo games, and nobody ever said anything about it. Now, it wasn't Mother's Day. Mother's Day was coming up. There were flowers for sale at the, uh, the Walmart. But this is a Wednesday. Mother's Days are on Sundays, so he, he's getting ahead of himself here. But he remembers the flowers being at the store. In fact, we'll get into the the story about the flowers here. And he remembers uh, the man coming over and uh, looking at these lamps. Uh, Fogelman and Ridge asked Dent about the time since school was still in session at 2.30 and the boys shouldn't have gotten home until after 3.30. 
At first it answered, well, now all I remember was Gail had, had fixed tuna casserole. Uh, Gail had to be at work at 2.30, said Dent. And he said, well, yeah, I guess she had been gone for a half hour, an hour, about an hour, I guess, before the kids there. Because, you know, some come to think of it, she has to be at work at 2.30. The kids don't get home until about 3.30. I don't know why I said 2.30. Dent described his lamp sale, and then Ridge asked, okay, when was it that when Jason, it, when was it when Jason left before you made this sale or after you made this sale? Dent says it was probably right at the time the sale was going on because, you know, I was busy talking to this man and he had already ate a little snack. They always eat a little snack when they come in from school. Ridge says, did he tell you where he was going or did he just or you assume to know where he was going? Dent says, earlier that day, Gail had mentioned to me about he may possibly go and cut his uncle's yard today because he was supposed to cut it the day before, but he couldn't because it had rained. Now from there, I think, all I remember is that he said he was going to his uncle Hubert's house. Now as far as I remember, Kenny coming over earlier. Little Kenny came over to see Jason, and somehow or another, Jason and him wasn't together at the time or something. Now, Kenny come back later on after Jason had taken off to go cut his uncle's grass. As far as I remember, he was by himself. And I remember little Terry was down the corner. Little Terry is the youngest brother, was down the corner playing basketball. So I didn't worry about him because I knew he was being taken care of and watched over by the people on the corner down there. Matthew was at the Walmart store. I left there myself and went on to Walmart and got Gail some flowers. I saw Matthew coming out, sitting out there playing a video game. I'm out. <coughs> Dent, Dent said he was returning some work gloves to Walmart to get a refund of about $10. Ridge asked, Okay, a few minutes ago, you said something about that Jason left, and then it was 30 minutes, about 30 minutes when you went to Walmart, right? Ridge, okay, so when you come out of Walmart, is that when you saw Matthew, or did you see him when you went in? Dent says, I saw him when I came out. Ridge, so about 45 minutes had gone by from the time Jason left until you come out of Walmart and see Matthew. Dent answered, uh... I had to walk there, and the walk took me probably about 10 minutes. Uh, now, according to Dent, the trip to the Walmart was about a 10-minute walk. And Matthew described it as being twice that. While Damien Eccles later on would say that the walk to uh, West Memphis and the Walmart was in West Memphis was so very far that he claimed he rarely ever ventured into West Memphis. Though we know he was hanging out at the Walmart all the time, Skate World all the time, uh, Bowen Alley, uh, the softball field, which is over in that same general area, just off Missouri Street. And Ridge, so... Eccles is lying, obviously, about not going into West Memphis. He did it all the time. It's also just not that far. It's quite close. Ridge says, Now, when you left Walmart, you mentioned you went to Kroger. What did you buy at Kroger? Dent, a uh, basket of flowers. Okay, the flowers were at Kroger, not Walmart, but that makes sense. Ridge, okay, when you got home, how long was it before Ken showed up and asked for this tape? Uh, Dent, uh, Ken sh pro showed up probably, I would say, about 7 o'clock, maybe 6 o'clock. I would say more like 6 o'clock, 6.30 or 7 o'clock, maybe. Fogelman asked, who was there when he showed up there this time? Dent, I was there by myself. So we got Dink Dent saying that 
Jason was not at home at 6 or 6.30 or 7 o'clock. And he's not exact on the times, but I think it's more credible that he's not exact on the times. Well, he wouldn't have taken particular note that day when little Kenny shows up. Uh, but he does remember months later. And it fits with what Ken Watkins tells police as well, for the most part. And then Ridge asks, then what time does Matthew come in? Uh, Dent said, Matthew had come in probably right about the time Ken came up, maybe a little after. Ridge, so we are getting somewhere around 7 o'clock? Dent, 7 o'clock or 7.30, somewhere like that. So we're now we're talking 7.30 that Jason is at home. Ridge, okay, so where was Terry? This is Jason's little brother, Terry Jr. So where was Terry? Had he come home yet? Uh, Dent says, Terry was home by then. Ridge says, okay, now the next time you see Jason, about what time is it? Dent, uh, probably about 8 o'clock, 8.30, because... Uh, Ridge, okay, did you receive a phone call from Angela? And she goes by Gail. She also goes by Angela, Angela Gail. Um, but we're talking about Angela Gail Grinnell here. Did, okay, did you receive a phone call from Angela? Somewhere between 8 and 9, somewhere in that range, and she was asking about where the kids were? Dent says, yes, sir. And that's a somewhat leading question, which Ridge was guilty of doing from time to time. Ridge says, well, when she called, the best estimate, about what time was it when she called? Dent, the best estimate that she called was probably about 9, 9.30, the time she usually takes her break. So, no, it wasn't between 7 and 8, as Ridge had suggested. Dink Dent puts it at a later time, 9 or 9.30, 9.30 being the time she gets a break. Ridge says, okay, and when she said that you told her that Jason wasn't home yet, okay, he must have come home just right after that, right? Dent says, well, he come home once and left for a short time to go return a tape, then he came back okay. That had to be around 9 o'clock then. Ridge says okay. And then Dent says 9.30. So Dent is telling Ridge that Jason didn't get home until 9 or 9.30 that night. Ridge, okay. Then he came in just shortly after she hung up from talking with you on the telephone then. Dent says, yeah. Now, the upshot of all this is the only adult who could vouch for Jason's whereabouts in the evening of May 5th, which is when the murders occurred, some, probably somewhere between 6.30 and 8 o'clock that night. Uh, the only adult who could vouch for his whereabouts didn't see him from roughly 4 in the afternoon to perhaps 8 or 8.30 or 9 or even later that night. Dent estimated some of the times, <coughs> but he was pretty clear about when Gail would have called, and Jason wasn't home then, which is 9.30. Uh, Baldwin was not home during the hours of 6 to 8, when the murders most likely took place. Ridge, okay, then he came in just shortly after she hung up from talking with you on the telephone then. Dent says, yes. Fogelman, did you actually see him when he came in, or did you just remember because hearing him talk? Or Dent says, I just remembered because I remembered telling him about the tape, just asking him had he eaten and about his homework. Fogelman says, how was he dressed? Dent, well, to the best of my knowledge, he was wearing his baggy pants and his probably a black T-shirt. That's what he always wears. Ridge says, what kind of shoes does he normally wear? 
that sometimes a uh, big old boot, you know, military type boots. Fogelman, do you remember what he was wearing when he came back in? Dent says, I really couldn't be honest with you what kind of shoes he was wearing or what he was wearing. It's been a good long while back. Now, one of the many ironies of this case was, was that this small town, small time criminal sitting in jail gave one of its most consistent, incredible statements. He remembered what he remembered, he estimated sometimes, and admitted being wrong about one of the times, and he offered no alibi for Jason, but did not hand deliver incriminating details either. In other words, the story has a, a great deal of credibility because he just simply seems to be stating the facts as he remembers them, with the caveat that his memory is not going to be perfect because, as he says, it had been a good long while back. Would have been much more suspect if he could recall exactly what Jason was wearing that evening. Why would he remember that? But he doesn't remember that. Now, he has reasons for remembering that evening, as we'll get into. So, it's not a question of whether these events occurred that evening. In fact, there's a very good time stamp, several very good time stamps involved in all this. Uh, Fogelman asked, do you remember if his clothes were dirty or muddy or were they cleaned or... Dent answered, well, most of the time they were dirty anyways, you know. Kids playing out there in that field back across the street and the old patch of woods back there. No, sir, I can't say for sure if his clothes were muddy or not. So <laughs> Dent's essentially saying if he came in with clothes that were muddy and dirty, that wouldn't be anything unusual. The kids around there were all, all the time playing in the field back across the street or in, in the woods. And Ridge asked, okay, was it dark when Matthew came in, or was it still daylight when Matthew came in? Dent says, it's getting dark then, about 8 o'clock. Now, he's talking about Matthew, not Jason. And it was was getting dark about 8 o'clock. Sunset was 10 minutes earlier, and it would have been f pretty dark by 8.15. Ridge, when Ken came by the second time, was it dark when Ken came by? Dent says, it was just getting dark too. To the best of my knowledge, Matthew and Kenny got around the house about the same time. So now we're talking about Matthew and Ken showing up at 8 and Jason is not there. Ridge says, okay, that's just the best you can remember that day? And what makes you remember that day in particular? Here comes the nub of the whole thing. Dent, it being Mother's Day. Uh, now, Mother's Day was actually the upcoming Sunday, May 9th. Bridge did not challenge him on this. The rest of the statement indicated he was referring to May 5th and not May 9th. But Mother's Day flowers would have been on sale at Kroger at that time. Bridge says, you mentioned you broke up with... Dent, uh, yeah, me and Gail had wasn't well. We were trying to work out a relationship, but then at the time she was wanting to get back with her husband, Terry. Fogelman, when did y'all break up and react in relation to that day? Dent says, that night, words were spoken, you know. We didn't, didn't want to be together with each other. Ridge, when she came in from work that particular night, Dent says, yes, sir, I can remember because uh, I got mad and threw the damn flowers off in the lake, you know, if that's the way you feel about it. Fogelman says, so it was that night when y'all split up. Dent says, we didn't split up. We just terminated our love for each other, but I didn't actually leave until two days later. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to laugh at this, but I, as many times as I've read this, it still just breaks me up. We terminated our love for each other, he says, and threw the damn flowers off from the lake. And he remembers that evening. We'll go on with this. Fogelman, okay, do you remember the day of the week it was when you left? 
Dent, it was Friday. It had to be Friday. Dent describes, he says he just subscribed to the Memphis newspaper, The Commercial Appeal. Ridge says, you didn't get the weekend edition. You just, Dent says, I just got the one issue. Ridge says, one issue, okay, Dent says. And she got, I mean, she was getting more issues, but you know, I wasn't there to receive them. In other words, he subscribed to the newspaper. Uh, just to subscribe to the newspaper, and apparently he was selling items through the newspaper. Now, where this small-time criminal was getting his items, you could probably draw your own conclusions, but not that I know for sure, but you can kind of guess. And he needed the newspaper, to. That was back in the day when one ads were a place where you actually sold stuff. And so he was selling stuff through the newspaper, and he, so he needed a subscription. So Fogelman says, but... The only one you got was one. Dent says, the only one I seen was the one issue yet. I only seen one issue. And after more back and forth about Dent's regrets about his newspaper subscription, Bridge asked about, quote, a knife that Jason had at one point. And we're referring to what is known as the lake knife which is the Rambo-type knife that was found in the lake behind Jason Baldwin's house in November. Uh, some divers found it on, based on a tip, uh, and it was belie it believed that it could be possibly linked to the crime. Now, Dent described a knife resembling the lake knife, but then Dent also couldn't remember seeing the knife around a home. I'm not saying that that makes any sense, but that's that's is what happened. He describes this Rambo knife, and then he says, but I don't remember seeing it around the home. Well, if he doesn't remember, how would he remember the knife? And more to the point, if the knife had been thrown into the lake months and months before, as uh, Jason... Baldwin and his mother both claim, how would he remember seeing the knife or how, how, why would he know anything about this knife at all? But he doesn't remember seeing the knife. <coughs> and again, I'm not saying that makes sense, but that's what he said. They asked him about Damien's garb. Well, to me, the clothes he wears is something like they wore back in the old days. You know, the long coats, black coats, the black boots, the black t-shirts, uh, black pants too, as far as I can remember. And he remembered Eccles having a pendant with a bat on it. Animal bat, bat, not a baseball bat. And that Damien had three or four holes in his ears for earrings. Ridge went back over the time frame. So, just so, I'm certain of one thing here. Now, he got home a little bit before 4 o'clock that day, and he left about 30 minutes later, you said, okay? So, that very latest he left was 4.30. So, from 4.30 to some, sometime after 8 o'clock, probably before 9 o'clock, you don't know where Jason was. <coughs> now... Ridge is being generous here because Dent was really describing Jason coming in actually later than that. Dent says, other than he was supposed to be over his Uncle Hubert's cutting grass. Ridge, from 4.30 at the very earliest, he may have been home as 8.30 is the way it sounds all the conversation we've had. And that's that's right. His earliest description would have been 8, 8.30. Dent that sounds right. So, Ridge, so about a four-hour period of time, you don't know firsthand where he was. Dent answered, no, sir, I can't say firsthand that I was there at his uncle's. Dent, whose uh, statement offered no help to the Baldwin defense, said Baldwin had been arrested just two days after he himself had been arrested. He quickly gotten in touch with Gail after he heard about the arrest. Okay, so I didn't get to use the two days I was in a, the holding cell downtown, couldn't use the phone, and when I finally did get a chance to use the phone, uh, a guy upstairs was watching TV. The first thing that comes on the news is uh, Jason Baldwin accused of this murder. 
So I get on the phone, man. I'm trying to call her at work, and they were telling me that she was about to have a nervous breakdown, and I do finally get a hold of her at home, you know. And this is when she tells me, you know, what Jason is being arrested for and all this. And I said, look, Gail, if it's anything I can do, I said, uh, I'll this statement to your attorney, the lawyer, I said, and I don't know <coughs> about it getting, notari getting it notarized and all that stuff because I don't think I can do it up here, you know. So, you know, Dent saying that he got in touch with Gail after the arrest and basically offered to help with the case if he could. Dent Ridge and Fogelman continued to revisit the night of May 5th. Dent said, the only thing I can remember, I was laying there on the couch and waiting for Gail to get home. She gets home about 11 o'clock and waking up and looking at the moon being a full moon outside. There was a full moon outside that night. Ridge, you remembered once before that uh, Jason had a girlfriend that lived a long way off. Dent said, right, he had made a comment about her because that's a long way to, you know, to skate with him at the skating rink on Friday and Saturday nights. And this girl obviously liked him because she called several times for him before, you know. This was a possible reference to one of the phone call girls from Bartlett, though neither was Jason's girlfriend, according to the girls themselves. Uh, his acknowledged girlfriend, Heather Clyde, did not live, quote, a long way off. She lived on the same block as uh, uh, Byer, uh, the Byers family and the Moore family. Uh, she was friends with the Byers family. And uh, so anyway, Ridge said some, there was something I was going to say about that too. But uh, now there was a lot of phone calls going on back and forth between uh, these girls and Bart. Well, these little girls are like 12 years old. And they were really, they were too young. These were children. Too young to be certainly going out with a 18-year-old father-to-be, Damien Eccles. And uh, arguably even Jason Baldwin, though that's a little closer. He was 16. And it's, that's more marginal. But there's a big gap between a, a, a sexually mature 16-year-old boy and a a little 12 year old girl you know there's no way they're really on par with each other they did see each other at skate world on friday nights so that's confirmed in fact we have video footage of damien being at skate world on friday nights uh i i'd never seen jason in the in the video but uh and i don't think he's in there but uh jesse miskelly is <clears throat> Ridge says, that particular day that we were talking about, uh, that you went to Walmart and bought the flowers and everything, do you remember her calling that day? Dent says, nah, I remember a girl calling for a Jason. Now, whether it be the same girl, I wouldn't. Fogelman, was that when he was at home or not? Dent, I was at home. Fogelman, no, nah, was he at home? Dent says, oh, no, he wasn't at home. Fogelman, do you know whether or not after he got home till that night to stay, whether he had any calls or whether he made any calls? Dent says, I don't recall him making any call that I know of. Now, I said that I was back there washing clothes, too, and drying clothes, so it is possible to go on through the living room, you know, back there by his room. There is a long cord he carries. He could carry it to the street if he wanted to. Fogelman says, do you know whether or not Damien was there that night? Dent says, no, sir, I don't even recall seeing Damien that day. Uh, now, Dent did not testify in the Eccles Baldwin trial. Would he have been some help to the defense case? I, I don't see it. Would he, you know, I can't really see the the prosecution putting him on either but because um, he doesn't really build much of a case for the prosecution 
On the other hand, he doesn't really hurt the prosecution. His, but his account lent no support to an alibi for Baldwin. So what we've got so far is Matthew's very weak alibi for his brother. That's it. Very, very early in the investigation, Bill Durham and another officer first heard explanations for their whereabouts that day from Eccles and Baldwin. Durham wrote on May 8, 1993, Shane Griffin and I talked with Damien Eccles, Dominic, Dominic Tier, Dominic Tier, who's Damien Eccles' pregnant 16 year old girlfriend and Jason Baldwin at 5 p.m. in the front yard at Jason Baldwin's house at 245 West Lake Drive South and Lakeshore. Lake Lake Drive has since changed. The name has since been changed, but uh, it's one of the main drags in Lakeshore Trailer Park, which is a rather large trailer park between West Memphis and Marion, Arkansas, and Crittenden County. They said that on Wednesday, 5593, that they had gone to Jason's uncle's house and Jason had cut the lawn. Unsure of the time they went or the address, it is somewhere off Dover behind Blockbuster Video. Damien phoned his father to pick them up at the laundromat at Missouri and North Worthington. They said they were picked up at 6 p.m. and Jason's father took Jason and Dominic home and Damien went home. These stories vary somewhat. Here they have Damien calling uh, his father to come pick them up, and he picks up all three and takes and takes them all home. Uh, according to Damien's later story, his mother picks him up. One of his later stories, his mother picks him up, and uh, they leave Jason behind. Now, it wouldn't have taken Jason that long to cut the grass that is... His uncle's house. According to Damien's own statement, uh, or, or may, I think it may be Dominic's statement, but anyway, Jason had already done two rounds of the lawn by the time they went to the laundromat. It's a small yard. Uh, a couple more rounds and the yard would be cut by the time his father got into the car and drove over to pick up Dominic and, and Damien. And there's plenty of room in the car. Uh, Jason should have been through with the car with the lawn, and it's quite conceivable that he would have been picked up as well and taken back home to Lakeshore because they did drop Domini off. That's very clear. Uh, Hubert B. Bartouche, the great uncle gave a, a statement to police it was differing in significant details on June 14th, 1993. On 5593, Jason Baldwin, my grandnephew, came to my house at about 4.30 p.m. and mowed my yard. He was alone when he was at my house. He left the house at about 6.30 p.m. and said he was going to Walmart to play video games. <coughs> I remember the times because Jace Jeopardy was coming on when he got here and Wheel of Fortune was coming on when he left. Now, Jeopardy was on at 4.30 that afternoon and Wheel of Fortune came on at 6.30 that night. Two hours, however, is an excessively long time to cut that particular yard. 1037 Park Drive contained a home of 939 square feet a little house on a lot of 7,405 square feet, roughly 70 by 100, with roughly 1,000 square feet knocked off because of the house. Now, depending on the size of the mower, that size lawn would require pushing a mower 100 feet from 40 to 50 times. The distance covered would be about a mile a distance usually covered in 20 or 30 minutes of mowing. Because the mowing was delayed by rain, the lawn may have been harder to cut than usual, 
though the lawn in 2015, when I looked at it, appeared patchy and scant, and lawns in early May are just beginning to fill out in the Mid-South. Other people who have seen the yard, Sean Wheeler says it's a very small yard and can, he can cut it in about 10 minutes with a swing blade. <laughs> I believe it, and I believe it. Anyway, he said uh, it's unlikely that would have taken Baldwin anything like two hours to cut a relatively small yard. Police didn't ask Bartouche why it would take Baldwin two hours to do a half hour's worth of mowing. I've cut, and I've cut many, many yards over many, many decades now, and I just have to say that that just doesn't take that long to cut a yard that size. Though I've never broken it down the way I broke it down here, but, it, it, you know, you have to look at the footage. The footage translates to mileage. It's hard to believe he, he would even walk as far as a mile in that uh in that within that yard but uh it's a, you know i'm being conservative with the numbers there uh ridge interviewed bartouche reporting he stated that jason was a few days late in mowing the yard and that the date stuck out in his mind now jason used mr bartouche's mower to mow the yard mr bartouche stated that jason was going to walmart after he completed the yard and that Jason left on foot. Jason was on foot when he left, and he didn't see where he went after he left the house. Mr. Bartouche stated on another occasion, Jason had come to his house to mow his yard, and then a boy he thought to be Damien, and a girl with long red hair he believed to be Dominie, had come with him. And Dominie did have long red hair. He stated that this was not on the 5th of May, but sometimes later he stated that on that date, Damien had been wearing a long black trench coat. And Bartouche gave no account for Baldwin's whereabouts after 6.30, so even if he testified what Jason was doing up to 6.30, he doesn't really offer an alibi for the time of the killing. Ford, Paul Ford, the defense attorney, acknowledged in 2008 that the lawn mowing could have been a mitigating factor, however. It would have placed him somewhere in a fairly critical time frame in the absence of Damien Eccles. Could have been probably the most important thing Bartouche could have done for me, or done for Jason, rather. But, you know, Uncle Hubert did not testify. On May 10th, Dominey had told police she went with Eccles, Baldwin, and Kenny Watkins on May 5th to watch Baldwin mow the yard. She said Eccles, she and Eccles called for Eccles' mother to come pick them up, leaving Baldwin unaccounted for. She said the time was near dark and they were picked up about 7.45 or 8 p.m. So they were at the Bartouche home now, it was getting near dark at around 8, 8 to 8.15. So, it took Baldwin three and a half hours to cut that yard, apparently. In her September 10th interview, Domini said they had planned the day before, on May 4th, for Baldwin to skip that school that Wednesday. Since Baldwin went to school, she, Ken, and Eccles spent much of the day waiting for school to get out. She said Baldwin came over to her home after stopping off at his house and, quote, we all went back to his house. She said Baldwin, quote, called his mom and his mom told him he needed to go over to his uncle's and mow the lawn. So we all got up and we all walked over to his uncle's around 4 p.m. She told police they walked over the interstate to the Bartouche home in about 10 or 15 minutes. Right. And again, here's somebody else who regularly walked this route from Lakeshore, which is where Dominie lived, over to West Memphis, over to Walmart. Walmart's closer than uh, Herbert Bart Hubert Bartouche's home, which is 
closer, further in, closer to Worthing Park, which is a fairly large civic park there. Um, she said she and uh, Damien had sat on the back porch and watched the uncle get the lawnmower out of the shed. And again, Hubert Bartouche doesn't have this in his story, so uh, not that Domini was going to be testifying, but it doesn't really help with the alibi that these stories don't match that well. Uh, just Jason mowed the yard. We all watched. We sat there for a while watching him mow the lawn, and then me and Damien got up and walked to the laundromat. He mowed about like three circles, and then we all got up and left. Me and Damien. Okay, well, I said earlier two circles, three circles, and they sat and watched for a while. Well, you do three circles around that yard, and the yard's practically mowed. Watkins well, stayed at the uncle's house. In an affidavit May 27th, 2008, Domini reaffirmed the story she told on May 9th, May 10th, and September 10th, 1993. Domini is, if anything, Domini is pretty consistent. Now, while timing and other details differ somewhat in her May 9th and May 10th statements, she offered no alibi for Baldwin for the late afternoon and early evening. Uh, Diane Teer, her mother, also gave a statement on September 10th. She told police that Eccles arrived at her home about 1 p.m. on May 5th, the same time given by her daughter. John Fogelman asked, how long did he stay, Diane, until Jason got out of school? Did Jason come over? Diane says yes. Fogelman says, Damien didn't go get him or anything. Jason just came on over. Diane says, yeah, they had already made plans the day before. Fogelman who was there at the trailer after Jason came? <coughs> uh, there was myself, Domini, Damien, Jason, and another boy. I believe his name was Ken or Keith. I don't know which. Fogelman, how long did they stay there at the house? Diane, about 15 or 20 minutes. She said Jason had to go cut his uncle's lawn, so they all left together walking. No, everybody's, t you know, everybody is talking. Admittedly, these are not the most credible witnesses in the world, but so many people are talking about Jason cutting this uncle's lawn on that particular day that the suggestion, and I've seen it suggested because Harbert Bartouche remembers different days um, and that this all occurred on a different day, just as I've seen the fact that Dink Dent mentions mother it being Mother's Day, that it's actually, a you know, he got the date wrong. Well, he didn't get the date wrong. It's just that he's calling it Mother's Day when it wasn't really Mother's Day. Uh, Diane said that... Uh, Dominique came home later after being dropped off by Eccles and his mother. Again, that offers no alibi for Baldwin. And Diane, Diane Teer doesn't describe the father picking him up, which is what Baldwin and Damien described just a few days after the killings, but the mother picking him up. And then later on, they... It, you know, became both parents. Ken Watkins had strikingly different memories of May 5th. He told Brian Ridge on May, September 16th that he, Eccles, and Domini went over to Jason's shortly after school was out. <coughs> Only Dink was home at first. After playing video games to the Baldwin trailer, the four teens went to Walmart to play video games. Wal Watkins left at Walmart at 5.30 to babysit. Watkins went over to Baldwin's house, his trailer, a little around 6.45, and Baldwin was not home. Watkins said he returned at 7 to find 
Baldwin, Eccles, Tear, and Dink there. He stayed till nine, and when he left, the others were still there. Now, needless to say, Ken Watkins' story does not agree with any other witness. So how about the Asian guy named Kim, who Jason claimed he saw playing video games at Walmart on May 5th? On June 6th, Baldwin acquaintance Garrett Schwarting alerted prosecutors to Don Nam's story. Uh, Don, he told, he said that Don said Jason was at Walmart till 7.15 and said Jason went home. And John Fogelman eventually made contact with Don Nam, who was a 14-year-old Marian student whose family was Korean. Uh, and Don Nam gave this statement to Ridge on December 23rd, 1993. On 5593, I went to Walmart and began playing on the video game Street Fighter in the front lobby of Walmart. I got there at about 4.30 p.m. and about five minutes after I arrived, I saw one of the boys that was accused of the murder of the three boys watching me play the game. The one I saw was the youngest one with the long blonde hair. I played the game until about 5 or 5.30 and then I went out inside the store. I was in the store until about 6 p.m. When I came back out, I saw the same long blonde haired boy talking with Damien and his girlfriend with the red hair. They were talking near the telephones. When I started playing the game again, I noticed all three of them walking toward Belvedere Apartments. Now, Belvedere Apartments would have been to the west and in West Memphis. I know all of these people from the newscast and them being identified by these names there. I remember the accused on the day before the bodies were found when I saw those boys on TV. I first heard about the homicides on the day the bodies were found when a lady was talking about it to someone else in Kroger. The three people I saw at Walmart were Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Dominique Tier. The very next day, Don Nam offered a second statement. I'm not sure the date I saw them at Walmart, but I believe it was about two weeks before the murders took place. I was mistaken when I said this took place on 5-5-93. Now, even without the immediate retraction, Nam's statement that Jason, Damien, and Dominique were within a mile or so of Robin Hood Hills around 6 p.m. when they were seen leaving Walmart would not have offered an alibi for murders that probably occurred a half hour to an hour later. Now, Baldwin's own attorney testified in 2008 that he felt it was better to go without an alibi than with, it, with, than with a weak one. I explored diligently any valuable and reliable testimony that would have established an alibi, Paul Ford told the court. I did not find successfully what I was looking for, an alibi that would not unravel on me. And that's it. And that's going to wrap it up. Thank you for listening. Just got to just got to take care of a few technical details here. It's good to be back. I'm going to offer more regular uh, my intention, and I, I think it, it will. This will turn out to be true. My intention is to offer more regular uh, uh, podcast. And that is it for today. I'm, I'm wishing you all well. Stay safe. <laughs>